everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome you to this session on closing the evidence gap for food systems transformation, enabling access to data and providing evidence to monitor progress. We are very excited to be a part of the United Nations Food Systems Summit pre-summit affiliate session. And today we are gonna discuss data. So any of you who are interested in data, thinking about collecting, analyzing, sharing, and using data, this is the place to be. We are so happy you've joined us. We know the pre-summit activities are incredibly busy with so many exciting sessions, but we promise this session will be equally exciting. My name is Jessica Fonzo. I am a professor at Johns Hopkins University. Thanks to the School of Advanced International Studies for hosting this session, along with the Alliance for a Healthier World of Johns Hopkins. I'm joined by my colleague, Kate Schneider, who's a fellow at SICE, Johns Hopkins, and Emily Ma, head of Food for Good at Google. We have a very exciting panel, and I wanna get us started right away. I'm gonna introduce each of our panelists. They'll give a quick minute, uh, two minutes, introduction on how they use data in their organization and projects where they're trying to close data gaps and improve data use and usefulness. Then we'll get into some Q&A and take questions from you in the audience. We only have an hour, we have a lot to cover. So let's get started. So let me first introduce our, our first panelist, Tanuja Rastogi. She is the Director of Advocacy and Communications at the Micronutrient Forum. Tanuja, say hi to everyone and tell us how you're using data. Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much for inviting me to join this exciting and timely session and to represent the Micronutrient Forum. So today, malnutrition is the underlying cause of 45% of all child deaths. And our mission at the forum is to address this and accelerate progress on nutrition, particularly in developing contexts and particularly for women and girls. We are a global catalyst and a think tank. We convene experts, policymakers, and implementers to help generate evidence and to support data-driven solutions, policies, and programs. And our focus is on micronutrients, which are so critical for health and one of the most cost-effective interventions for, for overall development. Our work in nutrition and micronutrients demands that we take a multi-sectoral and cross-disciplinary approach. For us at the forum, data powers everything we do. Data gaps for us mean that we're not able to capture the full story of what affects a, a, the full story of what affects and can help vulnerable mothers and children, including the problem, the right solutions, and the right interventions. And as a result, critical data gaps mean that future generations of children may not achieve their full potentials. An example of our work in this area is the Standing Together for Nutrition Consortium, which examined the potential impact of the COVID pandemic on the global levels of malnutrition. We knew that globally health systems were being overstretched with mothers having less access to antenatal care and food systems were being disrupted, limiting their access to nutrient rich and healthy diets and jobs and incomes were being lost as economies were faltering. However, estimations of the extent of the problem were being examined through single lenses in each sector. And so we brought some of the world's leading experts from food, health, and economics together to model the impacts and help guide policymakers. The results which were released just last week in Nature Foods were grim. Given the pandemic's trajectory, the consortium is now projecting a worst case scenario and in the absence of immediate actions, they estimate an additional 283 child deaths over the next few years. And so as you can imagine, we are raising the alarm in this and our big advocacy focus is to engage policy leaders to make sure nutrition is integrated in COVID response and recovery plans. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Tanuja, for, for your opening remarks. Next, we're going to hear from Dana Gunders, who's the Executive Director of ReFed. Dana, nice to see you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for hosting me today. Data is my favorite topic. Um, I am the Executive Director of an organization called ReFed. We are um, entirely focused on reducing food loss and waste 
in the US through data-driven solutions. And data is 100% at the core of what we do. We aim to provide data on the problem of food loss and waste, as well as the solutions. We think this is critical because namely the challenge of waste within our food system goes unseen. And the best way to actually know that it's happening is to see it in the data and to see it both in kind of broad national data, but also for a business within, within their own data. Not only is it important to seeing the, the problem, but it also is important to fixing it because you know, oftentimes people talk about food loss and waste as if it's just one problem, when in fact it is a complex suite of inefficiencies throughout the food system and design challenges that are there. Um, and knowing how to act on it really involves knowing where your problem is as a, as a business um, or as a policymaker, right? And so knowing if, um, why it's happening and also how well different solutions can aim to affect the problem. So what we've done at ReFed is for the US, we've um, taken about 50 different data sets and combined them in a methodology to paint a picture of, that helps characterize the challenge of food waste. You know, where is it happening? Why is it happening? What are the product types where it's happening? What are the reasons that it's happening and how much is happening for each reason? Then we go on to look at the solutions um, and, and quantify, you know, do our best. Now, are there estimates? It's a model, nothing's perfect, but we do our best to quantify for each. We have 42 different solutions on our site. Um, for each of those solutions, we try to quantify how much food could be saved by implementing that solution, how much does it cost to implement that solution, how much might it save in dollars or create in revenue, and then how many greenhouse gases and gallons of water could be saved from it as well. So we try to conduct that analysis for each of those solutions in a way that will help inform those interested in acting on the problem and help them prioritize, you know, where should they as a manufacturer, as a food retailer, as a farmer, where should they begin in terms of um, solutions? So um, yeah, we, we really believe that data helps inform action. It helps enable it and drive it. And um, we will, looking forward, continue to, to try to improve the data as, as the world evolves um, and capture both um, better information on the topic, but also hopefully some progress. Great. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much, Dana. Next, we'll hear from Carrie Armbruster. She is the Environmental, Social, and Governance Manager at Kroger. Good to see you, Carrie. Hi, thanks so much for having me, everyone. Uh, as she said, I work for Kroger and I um, lead a variety of ESG topics, including our social and environmental social impact work, Zero Hunger, Zero Waste. Uh, when we launched that program in 2017, our goal was to end hunger in our communities and eliminate food waste from our company. And we knew from the very beginning that data was going to be an integral part of that. One, we were very uh, insistent that we have a very transparent journey on this process. So being very upfront about where we stood with our food waste targets and uh, the progress we were making were really, really important. So we began to measure our food waste footprint. We began to measure our impact in hunger, both through food and financial do donations. Um, and through that work, we understood that we until we measured something, we could no longer manage it. And so measurement and data became integral tools that we um, integrated into our um, everyday processes. And what's been really amazing is to watch the way that we've been able to take data that Kroger has been collecting for years and reformat and reanalyze it and bring it back to our business partners and showcase the different ways that we can help manage surplus food within our system to both do a better job at ordering and reducing the amount of surplus we have to begin with, but also to redistribute that surplus food into communities that need um, it to survive. And so uh, through partners like World Wildlife Fund and Google, we've been able to transform this data and really use it in a new and exciting way to transform our business and hopefully transform our communities and the people within them. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Carrie. 
We'll now turn to Tom Danya. He's the head of Agriculture Statistics Unit in the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries, and Cooperatives in Kenya. So Tom, great to see you. Can you give us a bit of an introduction of how the ministry uses data and how you ensure that data gets out there to, to your fellow Kenyan colleagues and, and community? Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for hosting me in this uh, webinar. I'm very grateful to, I'm very excited to be part of the discussion. I represent the government. I work in the government ministry, whereby we try to get data, agriculture related data, the whole spectrum of agriculture, from production to farm inputs to, to, to foods, to nutrition, to market information, to trade, a whole range of data sets, uh, the, the so-called traditional data that uh, mainly the government uh, collects, including censuses data, survey data. Uh, trying to collect this data in line with our constitution that requires that uh, the government takes the lead in uh, getting data and giving it to the citizen as a public good. Uh, that is giving it without charge to empower the citizen. And uh, knowing that we are now in the third uh, global uh, revolution, the, the data and the digital revolution, uh, we have come up with a digital strategy. And the, the, the biggest component of that strategy is the data and the ICT to try to digitize uh, most of the activities and make them work better. We have developed a big data center with the support of the World Bank, knowing the value of the big data. And uh, we are a member of the, Kenya is a member of the global strategy, uh, uh, God and global strategy on uh, for sharing data on agriculture and, and nutrition. So as, as a result of that, we have a lot of pressure to try to provide data to the public using the so-called open data sharing protocol. So I'm excited to be here to share with you our experiences, the challenges that we have, and I'm hoping that the meeting will be fruitful to, to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. And it's so great to have the government perspective. Thank you for joining us. I'm next going to turn to Helena Laurent, who is the Director General of Consumers International. And Helena is in Rome at the pre summit. So, Helena, great to have you here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for having me. Yes, uh, in the most beautiful city. Um, and wonderful to be joining the panel this evening here. Um, my name is Helena and um, I head an organization which is a network of consumer rights advocates, 200 uh, consumer rights organizations in 100 countries around the world. And um, one of the, the most important topics that we work on is food, although we cover a whole range of other, uh, other areas as we think about how we build a fair, safe and sustainable marketplace for everyone. Um, today, in fact, we launched a statement, a call for action around the key topics that consumer advocates feel uh, must be in place uh, for uh, at the pre-summit, at the summit. I'm going to share that because um, I think you'll see how many of them are reliant on data, um, need data, used ethically and set up uh, in the right way to find solutions. Those include food access, safety, healthy diets, fair and sustainable food systems, and consumer information. Those five topics um, are really at the top of mind of consumer advocates. Now, the key question uh, for this panel is, how do we then use data to address those topics? 
Um, for consumer advocates, we seek to understand the consumer experience. So we look for complaints data. We look for uh, information directly from consumers about how independently they experience the marketplace. And you can see really sort of the trends that are on the edge, um, which are often happening in multiple countries at the same time. We try and understand those issues in a systemic way. Um, and those can be very complex. So using having better ways to understand, for example, online product safety that crosses borders or sustainable packaging, um, which requires an understanding of local uh, company, corporate and uh, national approaches, or even uh, then tracking progress against our goals. Um, we are attempting at the moment to put together an index showing by country how consumer protection and engagement is building a better marketplace. Um, having a real understanding and being able to see that in real time, um, whilst that is put in place with and for the people it's intended to help, um, is a, a very important challenge for us all. Thank you, Jess. Great, thank you. And it's really great to hear about those five priorities. Um, so I am now going to turn it over. I don't think, I think we're missing Crystal, who's from GIZ. Um, she's probably having problems joining. She'll, she'll join soon, but we'll move on from there. And I am going to turn it over to Emily Ma, who is working closely with Johns Hopkins. It's so great to have her. Uh, and she is at uh, Google and she's going to do a short presentation for us. So Emily, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jess. So thank you for all of you for coming today to meet some of my favorite heroes in the food system working on these issues. My name is Emily. I head up a team at Google that's dedicated to coordinating across Google and Alphabet uh, all the things that we can bring to help reduce food waste and food insecurity globally. Uh, today, also many of my colleagues from Google are here in support of Johns Hopkins and this coalition of incredible cross-sector partners who kickstarted this conversation in Action Tracks 1, 2, and an innovation lever on data and digital. While we work to improve our own internal global food program at Google across 55 countries, we also seek to share as much as possible uh, and do what we can, whether that's convening uh, different groups, um, bringing our engineering skills, bringing our products and services, and even in some cases, capital to uh, solving for these challenges. Google is also best when it comes to building coalitions and working with coalitions like we did with the Open Handset Alliance that led to the open standards for the Android operating system. So at this point with the UN Food System Summit, we are committed to rallying the resources we need to build the data infrastructure for a global food system. But we first humbly need to understand what the hundreds of UN stakeholders out there are looking to do with data. My colleagues within Google Research, Google Cloud, Google.org, the Data Commons teams would love to hear from all of you. We're proposing as a result uh, to get together. Uh, so we are uh, looking for a number of participants to roll up their sleeves, do a bit of pre-work and share the data that they need or the data that they have and what they hope to achieve with it. With Jess and her team, we will host a three hour workshop on Thursday, August 12th from three to 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Kate will uh, copy and paste the uh, link of the registration form into the chat window. We will select groups to present their data ask and their data offers uh, to be really, really concrete with what we're looking for here. Um, we're looking for you to be very, very crisp. Uh, this is a fictitious example, actually, from our own food service operation of, you know, a record that we have around a donation that we might make, uh, given some surplus uh, product that we have in our inventory. And ultimately, the purpose of us sharing a data set like this, whether, you know, as a snapshot or in real time, is to help food rescue organizations come and rescue more of the excess food that we may have. So before I hand it back to Jess, as snail's pace as some of this global coordination feels, I do believe in the African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you so much, Jess. Back over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Emily. And please do sign up if you're interested in joining that workshop and, and, and Kate will put that in the, in the chat.
So I'd like all the panelists to turn on their camera. I'm going to ask a few questions and please do ask your questions in the Q&A. Kate's monitoring that and then she'll she'll pull some some questions from the audience um, that she will ask the panelists. So let's start with getting our sleeves rolled up and talking a bit more about data. So when we think about data goals, how do you affect food systems change? Who do you want to influence? What is one question you can't answer right now, but wish that you could? So what kind of data would you need to answer that question? I'll start us off with Dana, and then maybe I'll uh, put that to Tom as well. So what kind of data do you want, and why do you want it? Who do you want to influence with that data? Dana, you want to start us off? Sure, I'm happy to. And I think when you think about, uh, to us, there's kind of two years of users. There's who you want to influence, but then there's who is actually using the data. And sometimes those are two different, different people, right? So we often think about a food company, you have, you know, a sustainability manager or, you know, perhaps Carrie is trying to implement their zero waste, zero hunger but she needs approvals, right? From all sorts of different, and not just approvals, but she needs buy-in from different players within the company. And so we think about the user of our data really being that, um, that champion within a food company, but, the, but who we're trying to influence are, are many others, both the C-suite as well as the operational folk on the ground who really need to be bought into to wanting to change the way they're doing things. Um, in terms of the, the types of data that we're looking for, um, you know, we, we originally set out to try to evaluate and measure progress on food loss and waste with individual business data and kind of aggregating that to the national scale. And we were not able to do that yet, or we have not yet been able to do that, I should say. Um, but we still aim because, you know, so right now we use very national data sets, their estimates, there are a lot of assumptions within them. They're not able to really track progress in the way that we're hoping to do. And I think to really track progress, you need the actual data. We only need it on an annual basis, though I think um, the users of the information could use to track their own data and use that on a more, um, on a more regular interval and, and a more real-time basis. Um, but I will give you an example of a different type of data and, and a, a, a challenge we have not been able to solve yet where we're really flying blind. And I would say that is in the home. So in the US, the largest portion of food going to waste actually occurs in households. And, and so there's a lot of interest in affecting that, but the reality is we have terrible information right now on what actually changes people's behavior to waste less food. We have some educated guesses um, through other behavioral science, but we don't have real information on that that's very data-driven. Um, and, and people themselves don't have the information. So one of my favorite statistics is that 75% of Americans say they waste less than the average American. And that really speaks to the fact that people don't, um, they don't see it in their own lives. And I think having better data on how much waste is occurring in households and what interventions work and how well they work would be really valuable. That's such a great example. Um, Tom, I'm going to have you come in and then I'm going to introduce Crystal who's joined us and, and have her say a few words. Tom, what are your thoughts on, on some of the data needs that you have? Well, thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, from the government point of view, you can imagine the, the wide range of data that uh, are required by the data users that uh, we are supposed to try to collect and provide to the users. Uh, foremost is data required for evidence-based decision uh, so that uh, people can make the right decisions, avoid uh, problems in planning, address the right problem and solve the problem better. And uh, uh, a worldwide spectrum from farmers to 
NGOs, to private sector, to government agencies, data that they require to make some better decisions. And uh, a wide range of data, including data that is required very frequently, like the commodity prices data and trade data, to data that may be collected over a longer period of time, like production data and all that. We also collect data to help policymakers uh, make the right policies. Uh, without good data, then policy would be skewed or uh, be influenced by other factors which may not address the main problems. Trying to make sure that the data is uh, used for making better policies. We are now in the digital era and, uh, and uh, the digital spectrum most people who want to come up with the new ideas, new innovations, uh, digitizing most of the things. And uh, you see that the, the blood, the backbone of that digital world is data. Mm -hmm. So people demanding data to come up with the new innovations, new ideas, develop new products, and uh, they expect the government to help in providing the data. We have researchers who keep on trying to research very many things uh, and trying to get data to confirm whatever they're doing, uh, whether it helps them. Uh, we have my colleagues from the private sector, I hear them speaking mm -hmm. about food losses. <laughs> and they expect the government to, buy, to provide some data on various types of, of losses, post harvest losses, um, losses at, at during transportation, during, during storage losses, during the food preparation losses, uh, are very many types of losses. And the, the, all these people are a part of the people we are supposed to help. Mm -hmm. So for me, the, 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 the field of data and the data users and the people to be assisted with data is so huge that uh, it's the story that can begin and end in very many years to come. Yeah, it's true. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Crystal, I'd like you to introduce yourself and uh, maybe where do you see some of the big data gaps? Where are you flying blind from GIZ perspective? And you're muted. Okay, thank you so very much. Finally, I'm happy that I'm with you because technically it was so difficult to, to enter to the Zoom meeting for me today. So sorry for that. My name is Crystal Vela Molongwa. I'm Director of Rural Development and Agricultural Division in the Global Department at GIZ, the German International Development Corporation Agency. At GIZ and for our main commissioning parting, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, data in general plays a very important role. We collect data in our programs, often in close collaboration with partner countries, universities and research institutes, and we make use of data for program design, learning process, policy advice and to measure the impact. I always say, if we don't know where we stand, we can't move. And this is very important, data collection from the baselines up to a coherent monitoring system, system is very important in our work. Yeah, under BMZ special initiative, One World No Hunger, we have two programs and I want to highlight first the global food security and nutrition program, this which supports the collection of standardized data on subnational level in 12 countries. The data is used by national partners with the objective to be well informed on the nutrition situation in the country and is taken up to improve nutrition governance on national level. The program Knowledge for Nutrition K4N is a joint effort of BMZ and the European Commission. K4N advises BMZ and the European Union to increasingly base 
nutrition relevant programs and policies on evidence-based approaches and strategies. So this is the donor level. So concerning your question, um, we support in GIZ uh, data collection to increase the understanding about different food systems components. This allows for a better informed policy, policy decision, as Tom also already underlined also. Data from our global food security and nutrition program, for example, is used for policy advice in our partner countries. Here, indicators as the minimum dietary diversity score for women play an important role, the MDDW. Thus, we are contributing to food system changes in driving evidence-based decisions for more targeted and more effective interventions. Another example is through K4N and evidence, an evidence gap map on food systems impact on nutrition outcomes was funded. The available online map improves understanding on existence and also absence of evidence for certain interventions within food systems. This helps research, private sector and policy partners to decide on which program to invest in. The question we can't answer right now is how can we improve the governments of our food systems at local, regional and also national level? and which innovative approaches of policy reforms are needed for sustainable food systems. Just Jeffrey Sachs just mentioned in one of the big opening in, uh, events that we need a complete different system. And so I think there we still have a lot of open questions. Where are the right levers? Um, uh, which we have to work on to really change the whole system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask Tanuja a question, and, and if you could give quick answers. Uh, Tanuja, what obstacles have you faced in finding data you need or sharing data that you have? Maybe just a brief, yes. brief answer on that. Sure. I mean, first, micro, data in micronutrients is a huge problem. And if you think about what is the ultimate outcome of what food systems are, we want to have access to healthy micronutrient rich diets. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have that data. So how, you know, critically, you know, the obvious is we need this data to be able to know where we're, what we're driving for. Um, policymakers are ultimately in the dark um, to know what targets they want to reach. So we need national surveys, subnational surveys. We need to know what people are eating. We need to know what's the market availability of nutritious foods. We need to know other factors that affect nutrition standards. So ultimately, we want to support these food systems and better and a more, more efficient and effective programs. So for example, their food safety net program, like what we have in the US, the WIC programs. We want to make sure we design them with the right interventions, whether it's supplements for mothers or food fortification or you know, access to more local produce. Um, so, so it's really, we have to really think about the end goal and then think about what is the data. So and also at the same time, we need new computing techniques and, and new technologies, including artificial intent, intelligence where to unlock data that doesn't currently exist. Um, and also identifying existing data that are not currently being looked at, but should be included. Great. And Carrie, what about data processing? Uh, wh what's been your journey at Kroger in formatting, analyzing, visualizing data that influences users and decision makers? Yeah, so not surprisingly, um, Kroger has historically done a pretty thorough job of tracking um, food that moves through our system. Um, the interesting part is we haven't always utilized it in um, 
the way that we do today. So understanding what we brought in and what we didn't sell is something called shrink. And that's something that we track very closely. Um, what we haven't always done is understood why shrink was occurring um, and what was happening with it after it wasn't sold. And that's been really the key driver for how Zero Hunger Zero Waste can shed new light on this data um, with the help of um, World Wildlife Fund and with Emily Ma and her team at Google, we've been able to represent this data in new and exciting ways with visualizations, um, trend lines and other uh, information and bring it back to our business partners and say, have you guys considered utilizing the data to inform you about um, patterns in surplus food, about better informing our food banking system, about when food is available um, and how it could better be redistributed and be redistributed in a way that is more efficient for both our stores, um, our community partners, and the people that are receiving that food. And so all of this um, rethinking of data that we've had for a really long time, we just haven't put in this way, um, has really helped us build a more um, sustainable and equitable way to redistribute food within our system and to reduce the amount of surplus we're bringing in to begin with. And so that's helping us with our ordering systems. Um, it's been really, really exciting to do this work and um, 2020 taught everyone a lot of lessons, but um, the inefficiencies of the food system was definitely one of the top ones for Kroger and for our communities. And so being able to um, jumpstart that work a few years ahead of that curve um, was really helpful for us in the last uh, year, year and a half. And to Helena and, and to others who want to come in, maybe Helena and Emily, it'd be good to hear from you both. How can a multi-sectoral, academic, public, private, multi-stakeholder coalition help you advance your goals? It'd be good to hear what your thoughts are, this multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder type coalition. And I know that Emily has something to say about that as well. So um, Helena, you want to start us off on that? And if others want to come in after, after those two. Absolutely. I mean, this is a time when we are learning and we're in a race. So you can't do that alone. We have to have uh, folks who can help us along that path and make sure we've got the checks and balances and say, hey, have you thought about this, though, to be able to do it in the right way and avoid the unintended consequences, right? I mean, for me, uh, the opportunity here is that we focus on areas that will impact consumers' lives. So people in the marketplace, it will enable many of the parts of the call to action that I shared before. And on top of that, and you know, that includes things like traceability, transparency, you know, um, we talked about food loss. Um, but even more than that, there's something about providing information to people as you go through a vast change in any system. And food is, if not the most important system we have for everybody. Um, it comes close at the top of that list. So can we provide information to people to help them understand what is going on? Uh, more information, more awareness of the need for healthy diets, the need for sustainability in food systems. That will be a great stepping stone. The second for me is consumer agency, giving people more ability to direct their uh, purchases, use their data to uh, drive and help them live more sustainable lives. Um, I think there's something about how we make sure that the marketplace is protecting and engaging people effectively through this data. And then the business models that will come from this. You know, if you start from a basis of let's build a business model for food systems with what we now know to be the right way, there are many exciting opportunities out there. And one of the pieces of work that we've been doing towards the summit is trying to explore what might those be with examples connecting farmers to consumers in places like Kenya, Ethiopia, Chile, Argentina, India, and China. And I think that that source of innovation is really exciting and needs to be done in the right way. Now, of course, we need in the back of our minds, or it's not the back of the minds, that's the wrong way of putting it, forefront, forefront here needs to be, how do we reduce inequality? The pandemic, you know, as we went into the pandemic, we knew that inequality was a global issue. 
The pandemic has exacerbated that. How does everything we do with this make sure that we close that gap? How do you know we don't rely on QR codes for people to be able to access something they need? Um, that is, is why we need that multi-stakeholder coalition to be able to address the questions, raise the questions and address them together. Thank you, Jess. Emily, you want to come in here? I'll be extremely brief because I do want to hear from the audience. Google was started over 20 years ago to organize the world's information and make that universally accessible and useful to all. And that includes food information. We know we're behind and we're learning from all of you in terms of what we can do. Uh, I realize that private sector needs to step up. We'd like to step up, but we also need thoughts from the public sector, from civil society, from donors to really understand what's needed. Right? We have lots of things we'd like to bring to the table, but we just don't know how yet. So help us step up, help us understand how information helps you uh, move capital, therefore moving physical items in the food system, help us understand that and we'll come together and see what we can do as the private sector. So uh, thank you again. I'm gonna hand it back over to Kate to run Q&A. Uh, we are uh, here humbly put to learn again and to bring what we can when we know what is gonna be most valuable to everyone. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks everyone so much for all of your comments so far. It has definitely sparked a lot of intrigue and some fantastic questions that we're seeing in the chat. Um, one of the ones that I'm personally most interested to hear our, our panelists react to is if you can talk a little bit about the urban and rural differences in terms of information gaps and the data that we have. I think this came from somebody who works in a low income country context where we often still see a divide between urban and rural issues and a focus on food security in rural areas. Is this a false dichotomy and, and do we have data that can show us about food systems in both these places, types of places and, and how they relate to each other? It wasn't directed towards anyone in particular, but I see perhaps Dana or, or Carrie might have something to say about it. Yeah, I mean, for Kroger, um, so Kroger specifically, uh, our, our data and our stores doesn't um, differ between rural and um, urban, but obviously our communities in general are very different. So if you look at the way we serve our customers across the United States, um, we see hunger in every single community. There's no one exempt from hunger. And so the impact of that just looks different in different communities. So addressing rural hunger does look vastly different than addressing urban hunger, just because the way people um, move about their days looks very different. And so it's definitely something I think, um, I don't know from a data collection standpoint, um, Kroger sees a significant difference there, but from a solutions implementation, definitely um, would look very different. I don't know, data, Dana, you're definitely a data expert here, but uh, feel free to weigh in. Yes, well, I think the information's different and the challenges are different, right? And so um, uh, you have the data collection is actually easier in an urban setting. And so what you find is that you have more information about urban, you have more data from urban settings and that gets extrapolated and often used to represent rural communities when it's not always effective um, or, or applicable in those situations. So I think, but it's, if you're going to collect information from 300 people and it requires being on the ground or 300 stores, um, it's much easier to do in that urban setting. Also, the funding for data collection, um, if it's public funding, tends to happen in urban areas. Even if it's academic funding, a lot of those institutions are in at least semi-urban areas. So I think it is, um, it's integral, it's kind of there um, built into the whole system that there's a bias towards urban data that we we don't really have a great solution for it, to be honest. So it's an excellent point. That's actually a great segue to another question that came up in our Q&A, and that is how can governments be incentivized 
to collect more routine and nationally representative data, particularly when so much of this data collection and these efforts are driven by funding from donors and from private organizations, and that would lead them to concentrate those data collection efforts in ways that aren't nationally representative. I think this also gets to Crystal's comment a little bit about the need for governance of food systems and, and how do we decide where there are information gaps. Um, okay, thank you for the question. I I think first it's important always to work together with the um, uh, with the governmental institutions inside our partner countries, because collecting data for us is also important because the German taxpayer wants to know what happened with the uh, with the country which uh, with the money development corporation is spending. This is one side. But the second side, and I underlined it already in my comment, is really to help the governments inside the countries to take the right decisions, uh, to plan the right uh, activities, and to continuously learn about the impacts of the activities and also to, to adapt them to the reality. And I'm really convinced um, uh, that a multiple stakeholder uh, initiative which is working together and create a platform for exchange and develop common goals will help to jointly identify necessary steps and with regard to the many ideas collected during the UNFSS put game changes into actions and this means for all governments, if it's Germany, if it's African countries and so on, it's everybody is participating at this change movement. And I think also we already have some experiences. For example, we did the work together with different um, uh, um, uh, countries, for example, Kenya, in Ethiopia, in Niger, in Niger and so on. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel, especially when it comes to data. That coalition could help to bring different data initiatives together, join forces. And I'm convinced rural is a part of a puzzle, as also urban is a part of the puzzle. But at the end, we have to put all the puzzles together to get a good picture about the situation. And the use of the data um, is really important to, to forward behavior change, to discuss about the right levers inside each country, and the levers can be quite different, and plan and realize at the end the right activities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. I think we're nearly out of time, but I just want to give uh, Tanuja and Helena an opportunity to make any final uh, comments or, or comment on either of those two great questions that we got in the Q&A. Yeah, I think that this is a great question, and, and particularly in developing context, what's so important is that we have multi, you know, sectoral data collected, multi-ministers, ministries collecting data so that, that we don't have one set of data coming out of the health ministry, one data coming out of the food ministry. Ultimately, we want data that that is about a mother and a child that represents all the things that they need and all the problems that, that affect them. So it, that's really important. And also, we need to make sure that this data is accessible, it's usable for policymakers. And I think that's a, where a really important role that technology can have, not just for government policymakers, but for consumers, for, for people, whether they're in rural settings or in private settings, and, they, and, and they, they have a cell phone, and they can see, where can I get nutritious foods, or what are the solutions available to me? And I'd love to jump in on the question from uh, Mila Chidzega, um, which is about how do we give data uh, for uh, empowering consumers? And I would give just three off the top of my head. The first is transparency so that consumer advocates and experts can look at what's happening. Um, two, simple, uh, effective approaches so that consumers can make decisions in the marketplace. You know, the traffic light system on nutrition, um, in Chile, you have the black mark if something has particular salt or sugar levels, etc. But simplicity to help guide. Um, and third would be 
uh, exploring data stewardship so that um, we can really start having agency and use of our own data to push the world uh, in a way that perhaps we might like to see it. Thank you for that question. Great, I think we're coming to an end if I'm getting the cues from Kate. Um, first, just want to thank um, SICE for helping us organize this, the Alliance for a Healthy World. Thank you to all the panelists. You've all been amazing, giving great granular details of how your struggles and, and but also the opportunities of how we can strengthen data. And of course, to Kate and Emily for uh, really uh, pushing forward this Dana, data cornucopia, not Dana, Dana, <laughs> data cornucopia coalition that's being proposed at the summit. And that's really putting data at the forefront of the summit for us not to forget about the importance of data and evidence in a time when uh, evidence is scrutinized and sometimes disregarded in society. So let's keep it front and center in how we make decisions about the food system and food system transformation. Please do sign up for the August workshop. Do um, write food data commons at google.com if you want to ask questions about data. We'll try to get to those over the coming uh, days and maybe the next week. And um, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the pre-summit and see you in August for the workshop. Thank you, everybody.